Good morning and welcome everyone at GOAT Day Applied Machine Learning Conference 2022 on this crisp, chilly and sunshine-filled Saturday morning in Poznań. Well, at least according to the weather forecasts made two weeks ago when this video was recorded. I'm Piotr Mirowski and on behalf of DeepMind and of the UK Meteorological Office, I am delighted to present our latest work on skillful precipitation nowcasting using deep generative models of radar. I work at DeepMind, a research lab in AI that is part of Alphabet, and like several of my colleagues, I am interested in applications of AI to the real world. For this project, we needed a partner and additional expertise. So, we join our forces with the informatics lab at the British Meteorological Office, the Met Office in short, which was founded in 1854 and which has pioneered the science of meteorology. As an anecdote, it is responsible for having moved D-Day from the 5th to the 6th of June 1944 because of unfavorable weather conditions for the Allies. In this project, our aim was to combine our strengths as two research-driven organizations to build a deep scientific collaboration. This was a wonderful learning experience for all of us as you have met multiple times a week, every week for three years. Starting from initial meetings at the end of 2017, we explored many types of questions related to weather forecasting and to climate, confronted our approaches, machine learning, New York weather prediction models, and found that precipitation now casting stands out as a perfect opportunity for applying machine learning techniques. And after a couple of years of research involving a long writing and revisions process, we managed to publish our work in Nature. This presentation covers that work from the perspective of a researcher in machine learning. The talk will be in seven small parts. It will last an hour. And we're going to start with a statement of a problem. Precipitation now casting. We know that precipitation now casting is the high resolution forecasting of rainfall up to two hours into the future. It is crucial for weather dependent decision making. Now casting informs the operations of a wide variety of sectors, including flood early warning systems, air traffic control, marine services, emergency services, energy management, etc. We believe that the now casting problem is interesting from a data science perspective for three distinct reasons. For now casting to be useful in these applications, the forecast must first provide accurate predictions across multiple spatial and temporal scales. Second, they must account for uncertainty and be verified probabilistically. And third, perform well on heavier precipitation events that are rare, but critically affect human life and economy. As you may have guessed already, our work focused on the UK. Our now casting models were trained and evaluated on data from a collection of Doppler radars from the Met Office RadarNet full network, which comprises more than 15 operational radars covering 99% of the UK. We can visualize that data as a grid of 1500 by 1200 pixels, where each grid cell of that composite image represents the surface level precipitation rate over a 1 km by 1 km region expressed in millimeters per hour. The UK uses a custom projection and coordinate system centered on the UK. The animation on my side is showing a complex rain phenomenon with convective initiation of rain, strong gusts of wind coming from the west that push the rain clouds towards the northeast with downpours and drenching rain over Northern Ireland and Scotland and a notch milder showers over the rest of England. Thanks to the Met Office data provisioning team, we were given radio composite images every five minutes since early 2016, which represents a few terabytes of data. We are definitely in a proper big data regime. And we're also facing quite a challenge for video prediction as we deal with tiny one kilometer resolution images with a data size that is dwarfing the size of MNIST digits or ImageNet samples that some of us grew accustomed to. 
We assessed the generalization of our techniques by retraining our model on slightly different data from the continental United States using radar composites from the multi-radar, multi-sensor MRMS system and acquired with a network of 146 radars covering the USA and 30 Canadian radars with 0.01 degree resolution, which is about a kilometer for each step of 0.01 degree of latitude and between 1.1 km in Florida and 0.6 km in Seattle for each 0.01 degree of longitude. However, MRMS data was not as nice as our UK data. And I'm not only talking about hurricanes, scorching and sweltering summers, or frostbite winters. And as an anecdote, nobody will be surprised if I say that it doesn't rain as much in the US as it does in the UK. Rain is truly a cultural phenomenon in the UK. According to the BBC, there was a study saying that 9 in 10 Brits have talked about the weather in the last six hours, which I guess doesn't include sleep. But more seriously, we noticed that the recordings of precipitation presented some skipping patterns, which were actually an artifact due to measurements from different radars updating asynchronously every two minutes. So we had to reduce the effective temporal resolution to only six minutes in order to mitigate this skipping effect and to make the temporal resolution comparable to our UK dataset. I need to say now a few words about Ensemble Numerical Weather Prediction, which simulates coupled physical equations of the atmosphere and generates multiple realistic precipitation forecasts. NWP would be a natural candidate for forecasting, as one can derive probabilistic uncertainty estimates. But for our now casting horizon of up to two hours, NWPs tend to provide poor predictions as two hours is less than the time needed to spin up the model and also because of difficulties in data assimilation of radar. So the only way in which we use the UKV deterministic forecast called rain flux was as baseline. We also looked at rain gauges, but data from rain gauges was very messy. So we used it only to calibrate radar. Surprisingly, orography and land cover was not needed to achieve good downcasting results, probably because of conditional independence given recent radar measurements. Finally, unlike some recent papers, including METNET, we did not use satellite data. Now, on to our baselines. We are first looking at STEPS and the corresponding open source Python library, PySteps industry standard models for probabilistic precipitation nowcasting that rely on multi-scale optical flow. The optical flow is estimated from the most recent consecutive radar images with some smoothness penalties and it is used to define a two-dimensional motion field called advection field. Using that advection field we can extrapolate using semi-Lagrangian extrapolation the most recent radar images to make predictions. Because of the application of stochastic perturbations of rainfall intensity and of the motion field, we can obtain different realizations for ensemble nowcasts, from which we can derive both probabilistic and deterministic forecasts of multiple spatial scales. Early in our research, we try to improve upon the optical flow-based methods by trying to learn a differentiable approach to optical flow. We used state-of-the-art PWC nets, as in pyramidal warped cost volume networks, which work well for learning to estimate optical flow from sequences of consecutive images without labels. Keep your eyes peeled for the following problem. The boundaries of the images where information is missing and where the neural network can find creative ways to make up predictions, basically smudging the edge of the image, which is not physically plausible. So we ended up not using PWC nets. 
Note that these experiments with PwC nets surfaced a workaround that we used throughout our research. We let the models make predictions on a wider area, let's say 256 by 256, but optimize the loss only on the central area, say 64 by 64, to avoid effects of wind-based advection. We base our margins assuming a maximum wind speed of 60 km per hour and 90 minute forecasts, which means that we have a margin of 90 pixels on each side. Our second strong baseline was the UNET encoder-decoder model used by several of our colleagues. After extensive exploration of UNETs, we made some architectural and loss function changes to improve the performance of UNETs at longer lead times and heavier precipitation. First, we replaced all convolutional layers with residual blocks, and we used six residual blocks that provided a small but consistent improvement across all prediction thresholds. Second, rather than predicting only a single output and using ultra-aggressive sampling during evaluation, the model will predict all frames in a single forward pass. This somewhat mitigated the excessive blurring found in literature and improved results on quantitative evaluation. We tried both regression and classification losses for units. There was a problem though. Even though units would outperform traditional optical flow methods in terms of metrics, they would produce blurred predictions. The forecasts would get a little fuzzy over mountainous areas, for instance, Scotland or Wales, where there is orographic rain, or on the coasts, and one could barely distinguish the front of the forecasted rain. So, we tried to get even better baselines and models. And our colleagues at Google Research, in a lab led by Nal Karschbrenner, published in early 2020 the MetNet model, which was our strong, state-of-the-art baseline. MetNet is a combination of a convolutional, long short-term memory encoder and an actual attention decoder. It was demonstrated to achieve strong results on short-term, up to 8 hours, low-intensity precipitation forecasts using both radar and satellite data of the continental USA. MetNet makes per-pixel probabilistic predictions and factorizes spatial dependencies using alternating layers of actual attention. We adapted the actual attention model, MetsNet, to our setting by paying attention to have the strongest competing baseline. In our study, we operate at the same scale as MetNet, which is 1 km per pixel for UK data and 0.01 degree per pixel for US data making predictions at horizons up to 90 minutes. Assuming similar rain cloud maximum speed of 60 km per hour, we needed margins of 96 pixels, with 256 by 256 inputs and 64 by 64 outputs. Therefore, we didn't need spatial downsampling. We reduced the temporal extent of the input context from 7 frames, covering 90 minutes with 50 minute intervals, in the MetNet implementation, down to four frames, covering 20 minutes with five minute intervals. And as we didn't have access to geostationary satellite data for the UK, we conducted our study using only elevation, position, and time embeddings, in addition to radar, of course. Counterintuitively, we observed that this additional elevational, positional, and temporal embeddings did not improve performance at all and the changes in metrics were not statistically significant. We hypothesize that at the time scale at which now casting operates, the phenomena presented by these additional embeddings are modeled in the dynamics of precipitation over input frames. We also rescaled the targets of the model to improve its performance on forecasts of heavy precipitation events, but to no avail. Even though we managed to get very good performance in terms of metrics, and I will go back to details of those metrics, there was a problem. The predictions were still blurry. What happened? I'm going to explain the problem in three different ways. The first one, we're making an analogy to language models. 
which are by construction autoregressive. Using DeepMind's latest language model, called Gotha, and published a few months ago on Archive, I have fed the following prompt to the language model. Precipitation now casting, the high resolution forecasting of precipitation up to two hours ahead, supports the decision making processes. Each of the word tokens that is generated is generated by sampling from a probability distribution over possible tokens. And for simplicity, let's suppose these are word tokens as opposed to character bigrams or other representations. A different realization with the same prompt, the same context, could be increasingly important issue of flood. Every time the language model generates a token, it feeds it back autoregressively as context of an example. And these probability distributions are calculated on the fly during the generation. A third realization would be effective planning of emergency response. Importantly, these probability distribution of the words are not computed jointly in parallel and ahead of time. It would not make sense to sample independently the words increasingly planning processes. It makes no sense, and actually that sounds like some bureaucratic nightmare. So how does language modeling and generation relate to our problem on precipitation now casting? Recall that the UNET and METNET models that I described earlier were making the following assumption for modeling the optimization objective. Joint probabilities over all horizontal and vertical pixels of a generated image, and in some cases computed for all time steps with poor assumptions about conditional independence given the context. The optimization process would optimize the mode of a distribution but would nevertheless assume conditionally independent Gaussian probabilities for mean square error regression or conditionally independent multinomials for classification. This is what conditional independence assumptions boil down to in the case of two grid cells, the orange and the green one. If we were given the context input, then under conditional independence assumptions, knowing about the value of one grid, green grid cell will not help us make a better prediction of the value of the orange grid cell. The input context would factor out the conditional probability. And yet, they are related because of spatial correlations and proximity. The problem is that even if we manage to train units and metnet and they get good performance metrics, we cannot actually sample from those distributions which is a problem once we acknowledge that weather data is inherently stochastic. So let me explain the same problem a third time with this thought experiment that ended up not being included in our paper. A heavy precipitation front of 30 mm per hour that is also very localized could move towards London or towards Brighton on the coast of England not far from London. That means that at time zero, our estimates of the probability of rain in London at time t plus 30 minutes is 0 0.5. And the same goes for Brighton. But at t plus 30 minutes, we observe that it is raining in London. What does it mean about Brighton? Because we have very localized precipitation front, there will probably be no precipitation at all. The problem with conditionally independent models is the following. The regression model will say that it will rain at a rate of 15 mm per hour in both London and Brighton. Effectively, because of uncertainty, it is blurring the rain over the two cities. The classification model, on the other hand, will say that it will rain 30 mm per hour with probability 0.5 in each city. This could mean four different things. One, rain in London and in Brighton. Two, rain only in London. Three, rain only in Brighton. Four, sunshine in London and in Brighton. It makes no sense. 
it can lead to wrong estimates of accumulated rain, which is prejudiciable for flood forecasting. The problem is that both of these estimates will have a CSI critical success index of 0.5. I will define uh, CSI in a few slides. So, how do we fix both the model and the evaluation? What went wrong with our baseline models is that they directly predict grid cell-wise or pixel-wise rain rate probability and that they are trained discriminatively with a conditional dependence assumption. They optimize predictions at each pixel location from the point of view of someone with a garden who wants to know if it's going to rain over their own garden. So a person living in a pixel. But without taking the whole picture of rain across the country into account, something that meteorologists do care about. So what we need are generative models that can produce plausible realizations of rain and derive statistics from them. How do we model them? As I have motivated for nearly half of this talk, we would like a model that is consistent across spatial and temporal scales, that captures rare events, and that properly accounts for uncertainty. Basically, what we want is a sort of neural sampler that generates multiple realizations for a given prediction. We can then calculate the uncertainty of these predictions from multiple realizations. This is why we settled for conditional generative adversarial networks. We built upon the work of our colleagues from DeepMind, who previously published Big GAN for generating images and DVD GAN for video prediction. Generative models are a very popular class of algorithms that learn to approximate the distribution of observed data X and to generate samples XS from that distribution. They are built using a deterministic model, like a neural network, but incorporate stochasticity through latent random vectors Z. When fed with a random vector Z, sampled from a multivariate Gaussian, they generate samples from that learned distribution. Conditional generative models predict their realization XS conditionally both on the latent random vector Z and on the conditioning variable y. Variable y could be past radar estimates of surface precipitation, and variable xs could be future instances of radar fields. A specific type of generative models, called generative adversarial networks, rely on adversarial training to train both a generator and a discriminator between the output xs from the generator, called fake, and any real target image XR from the dataset. Four consecutive radar observations, the previous 20 minutes, was used as context for the generator, but allows sampling of multiple realizations of future precipitation, each realization being 18 frames and covering 90 minutes. During training, the generator takes inputs that are 256 by 256 and outputs 256 by 256 frames as well. Learning is driven by two loss functions and a regularization term. The first loss is defined by a temporal discriminator, which is a three-dimensional convolutional neural network that aims to distinguish observed and generated radar sequences, imposes temporal consistency and penalizes jumpy predictions. The temporal discriminator takes a random 128 by 128 crop out of a generated or real radar sequence. The second loss is defined by a spatial discriminator, which is a convolutional neural network that aims to distinguish individual observed radar fields from generated fields, ensuring spatial consistency and discouraging blurry predictions. The spatial discriminator takes a random set of eight frames, either real or generated, and subsampled by a factor of two, and uh, there can be a trade-off between the two adversarial loss functions, spatial versus temporal in the GAN, but we didn't spend a lot of time optimizing 
but the trade-off and kept it at the same relative weight of 1. To improve accuracy, we need to introduce a regularization term that penalizes deviations at the grids of resolution between the real radar sequences and the mean of the predictions given by the model. And we compute the mean from multiple samples using multiple realizations. This third term is very important for the model to produce location accurate predictions and to improve performance. As a matter of fact, we can think of this third objective as a primary prediction objective, where the two GAN losses or regularization terms to enforce spatial and temporal structures. These two discriminators share similar architectures to existing work in video generation. So let's go deeper into the generator. The generator comprises the conditioning stack, which processes past four radar fields that are used as context. And this conditioning stack structure allows information from the context data to be used at multiple resolutions down to an 8x8 map. And it produces a context presentation that is used as an input to the sampler. The sampler is a recurrent network formed with convolutional gated recurrent units, GRUs, that use the context and latent presentations as inputs. The sampler makes predictions of 18 future radio fields the next 90 minutes. The output of a conditioning stack can be seen as the initial conditions of a sampler, and the sampler needs a source of stochasticity, which comes from the latent conditioning stack that takes samples from a Gaussian distribution covering a spatial 8x8 map and reshapes that noise into a second latent representation that is added at every time step to the count the GRUs of a sampler. These additional latent variables account for uncertainty. We train and validate our model on random crops sampled from the radar. And you can see here uh, 256 pixel by 256 pixel crops sampled from the data set with high precipitation values. We split the data into those grids of 256 by 256 for processing purposes during a training time, but we can use full frame at test time. The whole data set for the UK covers the UK and parts of Ireland for years 2016 through 2019. In one possible data split, the weekly split, we can train on Mondays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays throughout the four years, validate on Tuesdays and test on Wednesdays. That model has some advantages because we can assume that at deployment a forecasting system would be retrained frequently on a rolling basis. But it could also be argued that that evaluation has some causal and data leakage issues. So we designed another data split, which trains on 2016 through 2018 and tests on 2019. And we report results on that yearly split in the main section of the paper. At training time, we use an important sampling scheme to create a data set that is more representative of heavy, heavy precipitation. And that enables us to capture rare events. We evaluate our model on a test set from 2019. And because our model is fully convolutional, we can apply it out of a box onto a much larger radar frame than it was trained on, notably covering the whole UK or the whole US in our supplemental experiments. Both the radar conditioning and the latent variables conditioning are convolutional. And that's what allows for training on small crops while having spatial temporal consistent predictions during evaluation on larger frames. Unlike other methods, like MetNet, we don't need to tile and to stitch small predictions to cover the whole frame. And importantly, once trained, this model allows fast, full resolution nowcasts to be produced in about a second using an NVIDIA V100 GPU or 25 seconds on CPU. This overview of the technical aspects of the deep generative model of radar has, of course, a lot of gaps and unanswered questions, which can be answered in the paper, in a very long supplement, in a pseudocode, by reaching out to the authors or by asking questions during the uh, Q&A session. 
So now let's switch to the evaluation, the quantitative verification and its limits. As an introduction, I would like to say a few words about generative models, which raise the question of evaluation. The advantage and main limitations of generative adversarial networks is that they generate realistic images, which actually can be very misleading in many ways. In our very initial work, and somewhat in a jest, we did try to show meteorologists samples of GAN-generated forecasts and real observations, asking them to see if they could guess which was which, and even if they could be fooled. We noticed that the confusion was easier with single images than with animations of long-term predictions. However, that Turing test was not interesting per se, as our objective and metrics were not to produce realistic images, but rather to produce actionable forecasts. And as an anecdote, GANs are very good at imitating reality, and they were capable of generating radar artifacts that looked like radio spokes coming from the radar location, and when watched over time in a video, they looked like flickering, which could be due to birds or planes or other obstructions uh, passing on the trajectory of a Doppler radar. But let's go back to the metrics. Our first metrics is the Critical Success Index, CSI, which measures the location accuracy of a forecast at various rain rates. And we show here 1, 4, and 8 mm per hour. It is the ratio of true positives in the numerator to the sum of true and false positives, as well as false negatives, in the denominator. We can see that all three deep learning systems, UNET, Actual Attention, and Generative Model, produce forecasts that are significantly more location accurate than pi steps, the baseline in green. However, we know that UNET and Actual Attention make blurry predictions, and yet CSI does not account for all the different ways that the model can cheat to score better. So that's when the power spectral density metric becomes useful. These PSD plots show that both DGMR, the Deep Generative Model of Radar, in blue, and pi steps in light green match the observations, the black dotted lines, in their spectral characteristics. PSD plots also show that predictions of UNET have much less small-scale variability, meaning that they are smoother or more blurry, and that it gets worse when increasing the prediction horizon. To the contrary, predictions from actual attention and MetNet have a lot of small-scale variability, which is due to the high-frequency noise during the sampling process. I will get to that in the next slides. As these models produce blurry predictions, the effective resolution of the actual attention and UNET nowcasts is far less than the 1 km by 1 km resolution of the data. At T plus 90 minutes, the effective resolution for UNET is 32 km, and for actual attention is 16 km, reducing the value of those nowcasts for meteorologists. Before we go to the probabilistic results, I wanted to illustrate here the ensemble variability of GAN samples for six different realizations and at three different time steps, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 90 minutes. You can see that the differences across realizations are rather small. And more importantly, these realizations differ less from one sample to another than in our operation system ensemble baseline used by the Met Office. So it's going to be interesting to compare the probabilistic performance of pi steps versus that of the generative model. In order to obtain similar variability using the actual attention model, such as MetNet, we need to sample from the logits behind every pixel in the predicted image. However, as you can see, these logits are conditionally independent, and so is the sampling process. If you sample from a softmax applied to those logits, and even with a fairly low temperature of 0.5, you essentially generate uncorrelated noise instead of different plausible realizations. For probabilistic verification, we show here the Continuous Ranked Probability Score, CRPS. CRPS is the difference between the mean error and the mean intersample variability for different realizations. We compute it on the average prediction rate across different realizations and aggregate it over regions of increasing size. 
When measured at the grid resolution level, the GMR, our model, pi steps and actual attention perform similarly. As the spatial radiation is increased, DGMR and pi steps provide consistently strong performance, with DGMR performing best on maximum precipitation. The actual attention model is significantly poorer for larger aggregations, and it underperforms all other methods at the aggregation scale 4 kilometers and above, even if we try to rescale its output probabilities. So now, now let's use a single case study to compare the now casting performance of several models. We focus on this difficult case chosen by the Met Office chief forecaster who is independent of a project team. The case focuses on convective cells in eastern Scotland with intense showers over land. Traditional methods, such as pie steps, essentially try to apply optical flow here, but overestimate the rainfall intensity over time which is not observed in reality and does not sufficiently cover the spatial extent of a rainfall. The unit model roughly predicts the location of rain, but owing to aggressive blurring, overpredicts areas of rain, misses intensity and fails to capture small-scale structure. And the same can be said of actual attention. When you try to sample from the logits of actual attention, feeding those logits for a softmax, and after having calibrated the temperature on a validation set, we add unstructured noise but do not improve the spatial details of a generated radar image. By comparison, our model preserves spatial structures, represents the convection events, and maintains heavy rainfall in the early prediction. Our study was also verified with MRMS data coming from the continental US, where our prediction errors were lower than in the UK, both on deterministic and probabilistic metrics. We noticed that there were some differences in US regions. While we didn't conduct highly specific case studies in the US, we still looked at general comparisons and spot differences between the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, and the East Coast in terms of complex and small-scale rain formations, which we analyzed in terms of power spectral density. We conducted some ablation experiments to evaluate the contribution of different combinations of losses on the test set performance. For example, using only the per grid cell regularization loss, appearing in violet on these graphs, without any discriminator losses, we had the best results with regards to per grid cell CSI. But this also led to significant increase in the CRPS metrics and unfavorable spatial frequency power spectral density characteristics meaning blurry predictions. So, unsurprisingly, when we showed these nowcasts to expert forecasters, they definitely prepared the predictions made by the generative model. This case study highlights a limitation of using existing metrics to evaluate forecasts. These metrics implicitly assume that models such as numerical weather prediction models or advection-based steps preserve a physical plausibility of forecasts. However, deep learning does not incorporate any physical knowledge, and it is much more flexible, which means it can also gain these metrics and outperform those systems, still failing to produce useful predictions. So we therefore need to be thoughtful about the application of deep learning, because existing metrics do not allow us to discriminate between different approaches. Expert meteorologists, by contrast, have that knowledge, which leads us to expert evaluation. So, we designed a new type of controlled study of expert judgments to assess the performance of now casting methods. We would assess the preference of 56 Met Office expert meteorologists. We worked with a Met Office chief forecaster, who himself did not participate in that study, to design the study and to adjust the type of assessments. The study in itself was submitted for ethical review by an independent ethics committee, and I did mind we have a comprehensive process involving both an internal and an external review board that were dedicated to verifying the ethics and methodology of experimentation with human participants. Our hopes were that using expert verification would provide us with insight into the usefulness of machine learning in an operational setting, 
asking the question, could it even inform decisions on the development of new machine learning approaches for nowcasting? The experimental protocol had two phases. The first one was about preference ranking of predictions coming from three sources. Participants were provided with a user ID before the experiment to preserve their anonymity. They were shown a total of 23 cases of high precipitation data over 5 mm per hour or selected by the chief meteorologist in the following format. On the left, observation at t plus zero with date, time, geographic context. In the middle, ground truth at t plus 30, 60 or 90 minutes. And three comparative approaches to now casting at t plus 30, 60 and 90 minutes. The optical flow based system used by the Met Office, steps, one deep learning baseline, the actual attention model, and our generative model, always placed in a randomized order, with a color map scale for reference. On the right, the fall. The participants were asked to rank the model predictions compared to that known ground truth. They could also leave comments. In an operational setting, forecasters would often use multiple sources of information to make decisions, but we opted to show radar-based plots only with limited additional information to ensure we can limit and control the variables in the experiment. We also thought about the exact phrasing of the question and used a social science approach to design our study. A sample of participants were selected at random to complete phase two, a retrospective recall interview in which they were asked to review rankings from phase one and then were asked questions based on their decisions. During that interview, the researcher running the interview tried to build a picture of a cognitive process for decision making and important features, recall of a task, details of emotive reasoning behind decisions, blanks and mistakes. The researcher took notes during the participant explanation. The results were drastic. Most forecasters selected the proposed method as the most preferred, with the next most selected being the STEPS model. Key factors including the ability to capture well the extent of rain, even when the intensity wasn't quite right. These results contrasted with the quantitative verification scores that didn't give enough indication of the difference between competing approaches and that often favored models that blurred forecasts over time. These are examples of assessments made by the participants. In summary, we are very happy about running this operational assessment and believe that its success could help inform both how we run experimental psychology studies in atmospheric sciences, and how we gain insight into meteorological decision mechanisms. Most importantly, this operational-driven design aimed at ensuring that machine learning-based products can deliver value in an operational context. Which brings us to the conclusions. Now casting fills a gap in performance of numerical weather prediction models in the first two forecast hours. It highlights a role for machine learning to be complementary with existing physics-driven and simulation-based approaches. We're not interested in replacing human expertise, we are interested in empowering human experts with useful tools. Deep generative models like GANs can improve upon deterministic nowcasting methods. We are able to provide probabilistic ensembles required to estimate the evolution of chaotic systems. We are also able and suitable for high-intensity events. For instance, knowing the uncertainty of precipitation nowcasts can be used for estimating the quantity of rain accumulated over a catchment area. Finally, and looking ahead for our future research on long-term weather forecasting, we want to keep the human in the loop. We want to provide genuine decision-making value for reward experts. We have built the first deep learning model that significantly is preferred to an operational system by professional forecasters, and we hope to add to those opportunities and to build tools that are useful. Together with my collaborators at DeepMind and at the UK Med Office, we all wish you a hopefully very sunny weekend 
and definitely a gorgeous and peaceful springtime.